I think the mysterious sonic weapon attacks in Cuba remain interesting largely because of how exotic the weapon is. That's what first caught my eye and likely makes it stand out to everyone else as well. Supposedly nearly two dozen State Department employees have been attacked by this sonic weapon, which at least sometimes has narrow laser-like focus to one area of a room, to a specific person, to a specific room, and has been connected to a number of health-related issues that have been ongoing, including hearing loss, memory loss, nausea, lack of concentration, and a number of other fairly general symptoms, as well as claims of mild brain damage similar to a concussion. But that's what they say about the attacks anyway, because Cuba maintains that they're a work of complete fiction, the victims themselves haven't stepped forward, and it's unclear if this is actually going on, but it definitely could be. There's some very advanced weaponry that has already been unveiled ever since the days of the Gulf War, in numerous protest situations even inside the United States, and certainly in military and intelligence testing. They can do everything from kill to harm, to cause pain, to cause masses of people to run away screaming. You've seen LRAD devices used in riots and protests inside the United States and around the world. Bullets made of sound waves that can be used by the military and in medicine. You must leave the immediate vicinity. Sound bullets do exist. The idea of being able to focus sound in a very narrow spot, focus energy so that you can increase the temperature and, for example, cause um, death of undesired cells, like, for example, tumor cells. And this has been going on for months now. It's been reported since at least August, and it's believed to have been going on since late 2016, almost a whole year. More recently, a recording of one of the sounds that the victims heard was released Although I'm certainly not going to play it here, you can go look it up if you like. I have no idea what might be embedded in that sound. But so far, the Navy and other authorities and various agencies claim they can't figure it out. They don't know the nature of this weapon. They don't have anything like it. And they can't prove who did it, but there does seem to be a lot of implication at the door of Cuba. And what's very interesting about this is it's a virtual replay of the Moscow signal from the 60s and 70s, which was a mysterious microwave signal detected at the U.S. Embassy in Moscow that was traced back to as early as 1953 and was linked to ill health effects since at least the early 60s. And this thing was ongoing for a minimum of 15 years, perhaps as much as 30. And there's a suspected link to at least two cancer deaths of former U.S. ambassadors ambassadors to the Soviet Union, as well as a number of diplomats and staff members who had issues like bleeding out of their ears and other really noxious problems, shortened lifespan, and there was so much political suspicion that officially the U.S. started Project Pandora to study the effects of microwaves and radar and other non-ionizing radiation upon human behavior. But of course they claimed that was inconclusive and they closed it off quickly, but that's hardly the point. But to the extent that these health effects and behavioral effects are real, if anything even is going on in Cuba, and that does remain disputed at this time, it's not yet possible to ascribe blame. It could easily be a self-inflicted wound, a military test of capabilities, and it could also be an unfriendly act by a hostile nation, be it Cuba, Russia, or several other world players. And of course, it could simply be manufactured to generate news interest. Cuba, for its part, has vehemently denied blame and called it a science fiction. But diplomats on both sides have been set home, and either way, it's clear that the issue is being used as a pretext for tanking the diplomatic relations between Cuba and the U.S., and there's certainly a long track record of that in Cuba. Travel restrictions were finally relaxed in the waning Obama years after decades and decades of sanctions and a ban on American travel there. There appears to be an element intent on sabotaging those relations, closing off the tourism, and ending any friendly diplomatic relations between the two countries. And I just finished covering Operation Northwoods, during which the U.S. military mulled over dozens of different pretexts that would justify starting a war with Cuba. 
and the scenarios range from starting rumors to sabotage attacks by friendly Cubans to starting riots and to staging the crashes of airplanes that were marked up as if they carried civilians when in fact they were drones. They had several different ways of suggesting that an attack of one kind or another on a ship, on an aircraft, on a boat, or any other area really could be a trigger for the U.S. to enter war with Cuba. And I want to thank R.J. Soule for sending me the extended version of the Northwoods document that spans 181 pages of similar talk about what to do if the Cuban regime commits hostile acts, that is, if they're perceived, what kind of incident would allow them to stage an overt U.S. intervention in Cuba, under which conditions they would have the justification for restoring order by moving in troops and why they would need to withdraw afterwards, the end goal of installing a government that is acceptable to the United States there, and six months before the Cuban Missile Crisis, this report that's part of Operation Northwoods and part of Operation Mongoose talks again and again and again what they would do if the Soviets had a base or had missiles and a base on or near Cuba, what they would do, whether or not this would lead to an intervention. Communist-controlled or a communist-influenced military base in the Americas. These are Soviet jet fighters. They point up a problem which seriously concerns and disturbs all Americans right now, the problem of a communist-controlled or communist-influenced military base in the Americas. Soviet technicians are at work in Cuba now, building hard missile launching sites which could cover every part of the United States. And a lot of these scenarios became visible and others didn't, but it's a little bit too coincidental how much they talked about how they would respond if the Soviet Union brought missiles into Cuba, if they had, if there was ever evidence that they had a base. And lo and behold, in 1962, things reached a point where nuclear war was possible. Worldwide war seemed imminent and a wider war with Russia seemed really very much in view and it was narrowly averted, but history suggests that it was largely provocated and the blueprints for it are in this document. The incident itself built up after U-2 spy plane pictures showed bases that would have nuclear missiles on Cuba. These were released to the public whether they were legitimate or not. A blockade, an embargo was put in place. They called it just a quarantine, a step down from a blockade. And a few tense days later, a U-2 pilot was shot down and killed, even though they fly at 70,000 feet. Some kind of malfunction issue caused them to have to fly lower. They were shot down and killed. And the Joint Chiefs of Staff, who drew up and approved this Operation Northwoods, had previously tried to get Kennedy to agree that if a U-2 spy plane were shot down in this way, it would be an automatic provocation for war. They were looking for a reason again and again for a justification for U.S. military intervention, and they put one on Kennedy's plate. And I suppose the world is lucky that he didn't take the bait. But during that time and in the years since, there were several suspicious incidents, very few of them ever fully explained, that fit right in with repeated calls. And among other scenarios, Operation Northwoods, this U.S. document, encouraged legitimate defections and attempted to foster an uprising in Cuba, again under Operation Mongoose. But they talked specifically about encouraging defections. And around that time period, you see again and again in the newspapers accounts of pilots who supposedly supposedly deboarded their plane after they touched down in international areas or flew over to the U.S. And Pedro Diaz Lanz, the former head of Castro's Air Force, he was the first Cuban official to defect. And there were so many defections that they brought backup crews in case pilots were defecting in Cuba, so it was starting to make waves. Meanwhile, there were multiple accounts of hijacked airplanes and other events that seemed generated and making Cuba itself seem like a fearful place. And these events continued on years after the missile crisis was over. The U.S. never went to war with Cuba, presumably because of the negotiations from the Cuban Missile Crisis and an agreement never to invade Cuba. But events fitting the secondary description of sabotage and riots and uprisings continued to take place along with some very provocative hijacking and attack incidents. 
In particular, Northwoods called for an ongoing terror campaign that would seek to blame the Cubans for every incident, but actually terrorize people in Miami and actually harm and sometimes kill friendly Cubans, exile Cubans who were friendly with, with the U.S. government and innocent community members in order to stage greater and greater amounts of terror on them. And meanwhile, the U.S. and the anti-Castro side had been fostering terrorists of its own that were trained within the CIA that were funded and supported by them. To back up the hopes of those counter-revolutionary groups, tools like these are being collected, second-hand weapons of all kinds, which are loaded into small boats like these for increasingly dangerous trips to Cuba, taking in supplies and bringing out refugees and fugitives from Castro's police. In this way, many exiles have gone back to Cuba to fight. And all these things happened in Northwoods as a result of Castro nationalizing U.S. corporate assets in Cuba and creating a very severe backlash to sanction and blockade Cuba until they relinquished that back to the U.S. companies, which never happened. And while all this was happening, the U.S. and the anti-Castro-friendly side were sponsoring terrorists of their own who were CIA-trained and funded and supported, many of whom were Cuban exiles who were perpetrating it, and chief among those is Luis Posada Carrillas, who was accused of shooting down in 1976 a Cuban airliner with 73 people on board, and later of attacking beachgoers in Cuba and killing one man in a terrorist attack he intended to reduce to tourism and curb friendly trade between the countries and keep these sanctions going, which by the mid-70s had begun to cool off. Twenty years after that, relations were beginning to improve again, and in 1996, there was a scenario that took place that was right out of Operation Northwoods, which not only calls for shooting down a friendly plane, but discusses sinking a boatload of Cubans en route to Florida, escaping there, which is either real or simulated. While well, they combined these together in the 1996 attack, these planes were supposedly humanitarian planes searching for the boatloads of Cubans so they could rescue them, and they were supposedly shot down by Cuban MiG fighters. And although it didn't lead to war, it did lead to tougher sanctions and an end of the kind of laissez-faire attitude and re-strengthen that whole deal. The following year in 1997, Luis Posada struck again, killing tourists in Cuba, again an attempt to deter tourism to Cuba. So it's very interesting to put together the pieces of what may have happened in the 2017-2016 Cuban sonic weapon attacks when, by all appearances, there's an administration that doesn't want to get more friendly with Cuba, that wants to go back to the sanctions beforehand to please certain constituents. There are still people who do not want the Cuban relations to thaw until that long Cold War is finally won. <laughs> 